Good morning. Oh, brothers and sisters, friends and strangers, people I know, people I don't, if you're here, it's good to be back with you after four Sundays of being away. I haven't been here for four Sundays, which is crazy. Um, and it's a great duty and a joy to preach the gospel among you this morning. Christ we proclaim, the apostles say, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let it be to me according to your word, O Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. That's better. Okay, great. We are preaching through the book of Daniel. Today we will be in Daniel 9, verses 20 through 27. So as you turn there, if you have a Bible, there's some in the chairs in front of you. We're preaching through the book of Daniel to be reminded of and trust in the sovereignty of God over all things. Especially in this time of seeming uncertainty and obvious unrest, we must remember the surety of God's sovereignty. How fortunate for us then that Daniel, in his book, reiterates this theme over and over again, that the God of Israel alone is God, is alone sovereign, and is sovereign over all the things that are happening, even the ones that seem to be towards his people's destruction. And yet, God will deliver his people from them all. It was true then. How much more is it true now? Amen? So let's turn our attention to God's holy word in Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before God the Lord for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, he came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me to understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to you to give insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed about your people and your holy city, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy one. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven sevens. Then for sixty-two sevens it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two sevens, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end shall come with a flood to the end that there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one seven, 
And for half of the seven, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out upon the desolator. This is the word of the Lord. It is absolutely true and it is given to us in love. This is quite a passage, huh? (laughs) Thank you, Warren. When I meditate on this scripture, I feel that there is something missing. It's like this. If I sat down to tell you a story, say that it was a love story of, of two lovers drawn together over time, but forced apart through mishap, and misunderstanding, and years and tears go by. And as I tell you, your heart aches as they come together unwittingly, and they discover one another until this climaxing moment where he gets down in the rain on one knee and professes his love undying. And then I stop. I just end the story. What might, what might you say? Well, what did she say? <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly my feeling. No response. What did Daniel say? What did he do with this prophecy, this promise? There's no explanation, no insight, no, well, that was confusing, or, oh, I get it, right? He just moves on, chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus. I'm like, what? Right? If we don't know how Daniel considered it, how are we to know how to consider it? But seriously, what are we to do with the message Gabriel delivered? How are we to respond to this word? That is the question that I want us to consider this morning. How are we to respond to this word? So to do so, I'll break the question down. What is this word? How are we to understand what it is? Who are we? How are we relevant to this? Or how is it relevant to us? And how are we relevant to it? And therefore, how ought we to respond? I'll posit an answer to the question actually using a response given to the same Gabriel as recorded in Luke's gospel that was read to us earlier. In short, the answer that scripture gives us is that it looks like Mary. How are we to respond to this word? Let it be to me according to your word. So first, let me me give a caveat. Okay, let's get something out of the way and be honest. This does not read as the most straightforward passage that you could hear from Scripture. Okay? Right? If it does, you can come talk to me later, right? (laughs) Okay? In fact, this passage of Scripture is one of the most contested texts within the church. How one interprets it, its definitions, its grammar, its syntax, its context, all can significantly impact how one understands the past, present, and future of God's work. And as such, it has had great bearing on various schools of thought, various denominations and their splits, and even the formation of nation states. It is a significantly impactful passage. And all that being said, let me briefly justify why I do not want to get into all of the details, (laughs) okay? One is quantity. We do not have the time, trust me, okay? Two is quality. I do not have the familiarity to get into all the history and the details of these disagreements. There are brothers and sisters in the faith who have been gifted by the Spirit with much greater research and understanding and meditation on this 
And let me, let me name one if you're actually interested in getting into the whole history of interpretation, okay? Um, this is one from our own reform tradition that I and Pastor Warren have found very helpful. This is Kim Riddlebarger's A Case for Amillennialism, Understanding the End Times, okay? If you want to dive into the world of interpretation, of prophecy, I commend this resource to you as one that's very elucidating of the history and the sides, but also one that posits where our tradition tends to come from and why we believe that. Okay, so if you're interested in that, talk, you can talk with me afterwards. But besides those two things, quality and quantity, the most, the most important thing is calling. Okay, I am not interested in equipping you to figure all of those things out. I'm interested in fruit. I am called like a caretaker to help bear fruit among us. The Spirit uses the Scriptures like a farmer does a plow, right? He tills up the furrows in just the way that he wants so that he may plant the seed so that it may grow so that it may bear fruit. The word is not meant to be opened up by us to investigation like a riddle. It's meant to open us up, to open you up, so that God can do in you what he intends, right? So that's how I want us to approach this to begin. We're not opening up a riddle. We're being opened up by God's word. So what is this word? Let's start with the question, right? What is this word? And here's, here's a thesis I kind of have I'm going to work through for this question. This word is a promise from God given in attentive love that was fulfilled in the coming of Christ and the restoration and destruction of Jerusalem and is being fulfilled in Christ on the day that he'll restore all things. Okay, it's a promise from God given in attentive love that was fulfilled in the coming of Christ and will be fulfilled in the coming of Christ when he restores all things. That's our hope. So let's, let's break that down, right? This is a word of promise from God. I'm going to use the word promise over prophecy, not because it isn't a prophecy, um, it is. The apostles and Jesus himself understood it very clearly as a messianic prophecy. But because prophecy in our time is loaded with a lot of baggage of being ominous and foreboding and downright strange, on top of all the conspiratorial argumentation that tends to come with it, okay? So while this passage is meant to be upsetting to our perceptions, right, God's intention is hope. You know, if my, if my kids really have a hard week, so I plan like a surprise trip for them, right? And I start dropping hints about we're going to do something, okay? I'm making promises so that they can spend their time not stopping and trying to figure out exactly what I'm talking about, but so that they can be encouraged, that they can move forward until the time is fulfilled with what I'm doing. Similarly with God, right? I, we're not looking for anxiety or apathy. He's looking for adoration and anticipation in the meantime. The important thing isn't what's hidden, but what's happening and the hope that we have to see it fulfilled. And I think that's best communicated with promise. So it's a promise. These things are decreed. God has made it. It's a promise. It's a promise from God given in attentive love. And this matters, okay? This is something that's meditating on this. I don't think I, I think the Spirit really opened up on this. God's promise here is literally an answer to prayer, right? Did you see that in verse 23? Gabriel said to Daniel, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you for you are greatly loved. 
to emphasize this, I, I want to share with you one of my favorite quotes, scenes from a movie, which I don't usually quote movies, but this is a great one. Has anyone seen the movie Lady Bird? Ooh, okay, well. All right, well, in this movie, okay, a teenage girl has a tenuous relationship with herself, with her mother, with Sacramento in California, where she lives, okay? And she just longs to get out, to get out of the tension of this place, right? And she's sitting in her college counselor's office. Some of you are going to know this as college counselors and teenagers, right? You're sitting there looking over her college applications, which are far from the East Coast to try to get away, okay? And the nun, who is her college counselor, is reading her essay and puts it down and says, you clearly love Sacramento. And Lady Bird, as she goes by, in, it shoots this indignant glance at her side and says, I do. The whole premise of the movie this far is that she does not love Sacramento, right? And the nun says, you write about it so affectionately and with such care. She says, I was just describing it. The nun says, well, it sounds like love. She says, I guess I just pay attention. And the nun says, well, maybe those can be the same thing. Love and attention. Can you picture the Lord God Almighty, maker of of heaven and earth, who has the whole universe in his hand, paying attention to you. He pays attention to his people when they pray. Why? Because he loves them. Because he loves us, he pays attention. This word is not some abstract, cryptic message by a nebulous deity. It is an intentionally, attentively given message to one that God loves. And so whatever we may make of prophecies and interpretations, I want you to remember this for this passage. It was a word that God gave because he loved Daniel. It is a word of promise given an attentive love that was fulfilled in the coming of Christ and the restoration and destruction of Jerusalem. Right? So let me, let me get into this just a bit here. Let's take that latter part. Daniel's prayer was for the end of exile and the restoration of Jerusalem, which was promised. The time, this had a time and space fulfillment already, okay? Here's what we know historically about the end of exile. We know it from the beginning of the book of Ezra. This is the beginning. This is how Ezra opens his book. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, this is what Daniel was praying about, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put in writing, Thus says Cyrus, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. This, we know well from other sources, is 538 BCE. Over the next centuries, the Judeans, or the people we call, come to know as Jews, rebuilt Jerusalem and God's temple. But it was a troubled time. Judah was subjugated continuously by foreign rule, Persians, Greeks, Romans, up until the utter destruction of the city and the temple by the Roman legions of General Titus in 70 AD, just as was decreed in verse 26. If you go to Jerusalem today, you can see the Temple Mount, the remaining wall, of what was destroyed. But the word was fulfilled not just in the restoration and destruction of Jerusalem in time and space, but in the coming of the anointed one between those events, right? A Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. That's what Christ and Messiah mean. If you ever wondered what the Messiah 
is Hebrew, Christ is Greek for anointed one. Anointing is for putting your hand on with oil and sealing. Right? The anointed one did come as the man, Jesus of Nazareth. As our faith and all the Christmas songs proclaim and the scriptures make clear. What did the wise men from the east ask when they came to Jerusalem seeking? In Matthew 2.2, 2, they say, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star, and we have come to worship him. Have you ever wondered who these guys are? It is very likely that these magi, these wise men, are successors of Daniel. <laughs> wise men in the courts of the east, Jews who had stayed after exile and remained in Babylon, as there was a large Jewish community, who had remained in this practice of being the wise diviners and counselors of the east. But they remained hopeful from the scriptures of looking for the one who Daniel promised, who the scriptures promised was the anointed one. And they came looking for Jesus. Jesus himself showed that he was the one that was promised. When he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter, the apostle, says, you are the Christ that is the anointed one the son of the living God. And further, when Jesus asked Peter if he would go away, like all the rest of these other disciples, Peter says, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of Israel, the Anointed One, the Holy One. These are echoes of the language that Daniel is using. Jesus was opposed, he was pierced, he was cut off, rejected and murdered and left with nothing. He died on a cross in self-given sacrifice of love for sin and transgression and iniquity. But death could not even hold him. And he resurrected with power as we proclaimed in the creed. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead and pour out the end upon the desolator. This is the fulfillment <laughs> that we trust in. But it also leads to the fulfillment that we're looking for, right? This is a word of promise given an attentive love that was fulfilled, but it is also being fulfilled and we are waiting for it. The promise is seen as having been fulfilled and yet pointing to a greater fulfillment. The New Testament employs this language for a future coming of Christ as well as his previous one. The last days, the one seven and half a seven, right? that John calls the times, the time, and the half of times. That is our hope. Now, your translation probably says weeks, if you're looking. It is the word seven, seven being a number referring to completeness. And a brief note about what is a very largely discussed topic of these numbers. The New Testament seems to show zero concern with determining what those numbers mean in time and space. Zero. Rather, that God is true to his word and is fulfilling them in their time. That the apostles talk about over and over again. This is why the scripture can both have Jesus looking as before he goes to his death, pointing forward towards the abomination of desolation that is to come. You read that at the end of Matthew and the end of Mark, right? His reference to the temple being thrown down but also looking forward to the time that he's coming again. It was fulfilled in Rome in its destruction, but the language is taken to apply to when Jesus returns in the revelation given to John, when the desolator, that is Satan, and sin 
and death and wickedness will itself be destroyed in its own hell and heavenly Jerusalem comes down. This is the language that the apostles can appropriate, right? The heavenly Jerusalem comes down like a bride adorned for her husband. That's what they're looking for. And so according to God speaking through his word, the promise has been fulfilled in Christ and will be fulfilled by Christ when he comes. And prophecy is like that sometimes. Some people describe it as like a telescope where you see something, but it's in reality way farther away. Or when you climb a mountain and you think you're just about at the peak and you realize that actually there's like 10 more peaks in between when, where you're trying to get, right? Christ is calling us to live in what we know as the already and the not yet. The already and the not yet. The already that Christ has inaugurated has begun and the not yet that we are waiting for. We live in the in-between. In the in-between. And so to some, this word is a word of promise given in attentive love by God that was fulfilled in Christ and the restoration and destruction of Jerusalem and will be fulfilled by Christ when he restores all things. And we live in the in-between. And so that matters then as we move on in this question, how are we to respond to this word? In other words, how are we relevant to it? Who are we? I mean, there's a lot we could say about our demographic makeup. Um, while that's not irrelevant, that's not really what I mean. I want to focus on some things from this text to help us understand ourselves in relation to it. So here's, here's my thesis in this next part. We are sinners living in the in-between of the already and the not yet, called to be counted among the many with whom Christ makes his strong covenant of love. We are sinners living in the in-between of the already and the not yet, called to be counted among the many with whom God makes his strong covenant of love. So the first relevance, we are sinners. God promises to end transgression, sin, iniquity, and desolations. Well, we humans live in a state of sin and misery, as our catechism puts it. Sin, guilt, loss of innocence, corruption, and all the wrong that we do from it. Misery, shame, alienation from God and from one another. Wrath, curse, death, hell, and all the wrong that we suffer. Hurt people hurt people, basically. And we live in a cycle of hurt. You don't really need the catechism to tell you that, do you? You experience it. You've been hurt emotionally, physically, sexually, mentally, with hands and words. You've hurt others by the same. You live with the consequences of other people's hurt in your families and in your neighborhoods and in your cities. And you act out in the same manners and wonder how you would escape do we know this? Do you see it in your neighbors, in your siblings? If you don't know it, I can guarantee your neighbors do. We are corrupted by sin, sinning and being sinned against, and we long for an end to it. For justice, righteousness, wholeness, peace, the silent voices of your hearts that you may or may not be in touch with cry out for it. People in the streets cry out for it. And we're meant to. The image of God in us, that's God speaking through us. We are sinners, whether we believe it or not, feel it or not, but so it is relevant when God makes a promise to end sin. Right? 
But the second relevance, we are sinners living in the in-between of this already and this not yet. In other words, we're alive today, okay? Like right now. Well, so what do we do with this? So what? Well, God has promised an anointed one who died and rose again to usher in a new age of salvation. And the old one is gone. He did those things in a promise of something greater. So to trust God, what he has done, necessitates trust in God with what he will do. But please hear this, okay? The truth of the time, this in-between time in which we live, does not depend on your belief or your faith or your religion or lack thereof. Okay? That Christ says he's returning to desolate and make an end to desolation is his claim, not yours. He's either wrong or he's right. It's either true or it's false. He's coming or he's not. Whether we believe it or look for it or not, I tell my kids all the time to look both ways when they cross the street, right? Not so they can make a car come or not. Whether they are looking does not make the car come. It's because the car may be coming regardless of whether they are looking. Whether they look will impact how that encounter goes. Do you get what I'm saying? What I'm saying is this. We live in an impending moment, an in-between impending moment when the anointed one will come swifter than any wings of abominations or desolations promised here, like a thief in the night. Jesus says, in order to put an end to sin and iniquity and transgression, to reveal and judgment and throw it all into eternal fire, he must come to judge. That is what we proclaim as good news. It's good news that it's impending and coming. And if that doesn't sound like good news to you, I get that. But please consider then the ones for whom it is good news, the victim, the sufferer, the abused, the oppressed, the sinned against, for whom it is certainly salvation that God comes swiftly to destroy their afflictor. And that may be you who longs for God's rescue. And that may be you who is afflicting. And what a world we live in when we could be both, right? Or consider yourself, whether you are too in love with some wickedness, some iniquity, some sin, and you would rather continue in it, disrespecting God, desolating others, and dismissing this promise, clinging foolishly and lustfully to something that God is promising, I am coming to sweep away. Do not be swept away with it. Like Gollum clutching a ring into the fire. Wouldn't you rather be free? God promises freedom. And in any case, a promised reckoning is coming, and we live in the way. And so it is relevant to us. And that's, I'm not trying to be scary about that. I mean, maybe a little bit, because I think we're too comfortable, right? And comfort does not service those who are called to stay awake and watch, right? But really, it does bring to our third relevance, right? Where sinners who live in the in-between of the already and the not yet called to be counted among the many with whom Christ makes a strong covenant of love. I referenced the catechism earlier, right? 
about our fallen human condition. Do you know what the next question is in the shorter catechism? Did God leave all mankind to perish in an estate of sin and misery? The very short answer is no. But they say this, God having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity elected some to everlasting life did enter into a covenant with them of grace to deliver them out of an estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. Y'all, does this not beautifully capture God's promise? The redeemer is someone who is willing and able to buy back, to reclaim what was lost and restore its value. The redeemer who God appointed is the anointed one, Jesus. He redeems men and women trapped in sin and misery, delivering them, as the apostles say, from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And how? By making a new covenant with them. Cutting it, the Hebrew says, in his own flesh. A strong covenant. Do you know what a covenant is? I just officiated a couple weddings, so this is in my mind, right? A covenant is an enacted promise. A promise of union. I mean, think about a marriage. A covenant of marriage is a new union so, sealed in a promise, grown and worked out in a promise. Christ unites sinners to himself by entering into our misery, taking onto himself our guilt and our shame, reconciling us corporally in himself, and uniting us strongly in his embrace, giving us his eternal righteousness. We're sealed in him. Like, I'm even doing this, right? Like, sealed in him. Because he loves us. That merely is not flippant. It's, it's out of pleasure because he loves us. And that's really what elect means. It means beloved, elected, chose because he loved us. Loved some into everlasting life. And that love we see on the cross. For no greater love does one know than that man lay down his life for his friends. Your friend is your rescuer. That's the God who we see making this promise. That's who Christ is and his strong covenant of love. But who are you? You, I, we are some of the many. Many is a nebulous, limitless, kind of undefined and unconstrained term, right? Did you notice that term here? It's verse 27 at the end. He shall make a strong covenant with many. It is those who know, those who don't, those who care, those who don't, those who grew up on the right side of the tracks and the right family, and those who didn't. It's those who are near and those who are far, those who are taken in, cast down, beaten up, who have fooled around and run amok, who have hit rock bottom and been packed into a corner, who can't straighten up, straighten out, fly right. It's the victim. It's the perpetrator. It's the oppressed. It's the oppressor. It's the abused. It's the abuser. It's the self-righteous and the unrighteous. Peoples of every tribe and nation, it is many. Many is a motley crew. And God is promising to make from this motley crew, this motley crew, his many. He's promising to make us his many because of the great love with which he loves us. When I got down on a knee to propose to Elizabeth with my intention to marry her, because of my love for her, my initiation and her acceptance brought union. 
It made her from any other woman to my wife. And being united to Christ in his covenant, likewise, brings us from any many to one of his many. That's his promise. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and lay his life down as a ransom for many. His proposal is freely given to us. His covenant is sure and strong. And it will be consummated in a marriage feast. Will you accept it? Will you accept his ring of baptism and faith? It's a real promise. And so that brings us to the last part of our question and conclusion here. We're sinners living in the in-between time of the already and the not yet called to be counted among the many with whom God makes a strong covenant of love by this word of promise given to us in love that was fulfilled and is being fulfilled. And so how do we respond to it? How do you, how do you respond to this? How do we respond to any promises that God makes? Whether commands or hopes. There's a lot of ways that we could take that. And because of this Advent season and because of our reading, I want to look at just one as a way to practice. I want us to look at Mary. I want us to look at how Mary responded to the promise God made her through the same Gabriel as a way to inspire us to exercise hope. Do you remember the passage that our sister read for us earlier? Did you hear the echoes of this passage? The same angel Gabriel comes with a word from God to Mary, whom he addresses as a favored one, a beloved one, about the restoration of the kingdom, the promise of a holy one. But this time, she, a virgin girl, will bear that Holy One and be his mother. Talk about receiving a promise, right? How does one respond to that? And every year at Advent, I am restruck by her response in verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. What grace God must have filled her with to bring forth such a response. Amid what was surely a terrifying and confusing moment, she accepted his word. She didn't just believe it theoretically or factually. She received it. Let it be to me. Let my life be changed accordingly by you. Indeed, she receives it very literally as the word becomes flesh in her womb. And that's a very unique incarnation of the word of God, utterly unique. But spiritually, as we said before, the word is always to implant and grow fruitfully in our own hearts, to make us receptive to what is grown. And so responding like Mary can be an example among our church of how to be fruitful And brothers and sisters, you who have professed faith in Christ have been graced with the same Holy Spirit to bear fruit from God's word. This Advent season is one where we wait upon God's promises. And so it's a most fitting one to practice. Let it be to me according to your word. It's a response of trust and courage, surely. Let it be. But it's also a plea. Please, please let it be to me according to your word. This is what our Puritan forefathers and mothers meant when they advocated pleading the promises. Plead God's promises like Daniel did in confessional prayer. Pleads God's promises like Mary does. Please let it be to me according to your word. When you do, you join Christ's own plea. Do you know he reigns in heaven as he is awaiting his second coming, interceding for us 
before the throne of God, saying, please, let it be to them according to my word. You join God himself when we respond to his word in this way. And so you can trust that you are praying according to his will. And so let us practice that. When we hear the word of God, like the word of assurance that was read earlier from Titus, let it be to me according to your word, O Lord. Practice it here corporately together, individually in your own times. Let it be so. Let it be to us according to your word that you hear our prayers when we pray them and that we are greatly loved. Let it be to us according to your word that you would finish transgression, that we would be finished of our transgression, of transgression against us. Let it be to us according to our, your word that you would reconcile us and atone for our iniquity. Let it be to us according to your word that you would bring us an everlasting righteousness and we would escape the cycles of sin and death that we would know and trust and proclaim and stand in it. Let it be to us according to your word that we would wait for the fulfillment of your time, that we would rejoice in tribulation, that we would cast all our anxieties upon you because you care for us. Let it be to us according to your word that we would experience the sweetness of the union that you promise. And let it be to us according to your word, that we would see the destruction of the desolator and your peace and your heavenly Jerusalem restored. That's how we respond to the word. That's how we respond to God's promises. We plead them. Let it be to us according to your word. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.